everybody. Welcome to the Guys Learning Japanese podcast. How's it going, Nick? It's going good. How are you? Pretty good. Something、uh, I thought that was kind of interesting recently、uh, I was Googling learning Japanese, partially just to see what the search results were and also to see if our podcast would come up in the search results. And actually, they did. Come up in the search results, some of the YouTube videos and links to the actual podcast. So I was pretty happy about that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah.、Um, thanks to all our wonderful listeners, right? Yeah. <laughs> all seven of you. <laughs> But、uh, something that really surprised me when I was going through these results were different resources,、uh, for example, different tables. Different、uh, image files that people had created. And I thought, oh, that looks kind of interesting. I'll have a look at that. And I was really, really shocked.、Uh, just for example, some of the anatomy questions、uh, they had, for example, leg, arm, fingers, you know, chest, all things like that. Very simple. Japanese words that you could easily look up in a dictionary, but the results were just terrible. Like the English was, of course, correct, but what they had written in Japanese,、uh, I'll just give you one example. I don't want to rant too much about this, but for arms, it had buki,、mm, which means weapon or weapons. Yes, exactly. So, yes, they are arms. As in armed forces, but、uh, I was just really surprised. And this was just one example. There were many other examples similar to this. And I was really shocked to see that there are a lot of people with no experience, or, or very little experience, I should say, and very little、uh, know how or knowledge. To produce resources that are actually producing these resources. Yeah, so for today,、uh, that was kind of a long intro, but I would like to talk about methods, methods, and how these resources relate to methods and、uh, different ways that people may study. Yeah. Okay, so.、Uh, How about let's talk about some guidelines?、Uh, what, if, if you have any guidelines for different study methods, what would you suggest? Yeah, well,、uh, I think、uh, a guiding guideline for me is、uh, pretty much just to do whatever I like as long as it's in Japanese. Do you have a guideline like that? Uh, that would be my only guideline, actually. <laughs> <Yeah> . like, <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's Japanese made by Japanese people. For Japanese people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I just think, regardless of what you're studying,、uh, as long as you're looking at native materials,、uh, I think you're going to be safe. It's just much, much more beneficial. And, and that includes anime and dramas and manga. Does that include all of those for you? Everything, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think at the beginning it may be hard because you might not have the vocabulary. And building that initial vocabulary, I think you don't have to use Japanese only materials then, but.、Uh, Ideally, you want to just get some basic vocabulary and then as quickly as possible move towards Japanese only resources, like Japanese, like native Japanese materials. The earlier you do that, I think you're just minimizing the, the damage that English could do onto your Japanese. Yeah, people say much the same thing with.、Um... With the relying on gomaji compared to upgrading to、um, actual Japanese characters like、um, hiragana or katakana or kanji. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people say it's better to get out of gomaji as quick as possible. And 
yeah, I would agree with you that it's it's similar similarly uh, a really good idea to get out of uh, um, English resources, or rather, I should say, uh, resources made by English speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, besides doing things in Japanese and um, and using Japanese resources, I also think, and this is hard to do because, you know, I want to be an adult and I want to be interested in adult things, but I think it's important to be reasonable as well. And when I say that, I mean to be considerate of what your current Japanese level is and not try and reach too far. I actually think if you really, really, really want to read the newspaper, for example, and you're a beginner in Japanese and you really want to read the Japanese newspaper, then you can. Um, but I think it's important to be aware that the learning curve will be enormous. Yeah, so if you're if you're always reading the paper the paper in your uh, native language, um, and you really want to read the paper in in Japanese, yeah, it's just going to be very 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 difficult, probably for a very long time. And so if you can fight that constant disappointment for probably a quite a few years, then at the end of those few years, you'll probably be able to read the paper really really good. And of course, your Japanese would have improved a lot and you'll be doing what you know you always wanted to do but for me personally I just couldn't handle the rejection and so uh, I always I started you know just picking uh, picking and choosing some simpler resources for myself like I've said before on this podcast I often read uh, kids books and I remember when I first got really serious about learning Japanese I went to the library in Japan and I would actually get uh, storybooks for kids and I'd buy, or not buy, I'd borrow maybe five of them and I'd sit down and I would just look at those and it seems a bit embarrassing but uh, but you know I was I was trying my best and that's, that was I essentially figured out that was my level and so I was just there and I was, I mean I learned a lot of words that way and then I upgraded slowly to um, to very short novels and now I'm reading more regular length novels and watching regular TV shows and whatnot. How about you? Do you would you have that same advice? Yeah, basically. I think you just have to be aware of your level. Uh you were saying that maybe you could try and read the newspaper, but for me I'm all about conserving my resources rather than uh being a beginner trying to read the newspaper and looking up every word in the the newspaper and then just maybe writing a definition or trying to remember what each word is word for word I would rather just come back to it later uh, I would choose something much closer to my level uh, swallow your pride and just read a kids book read a book that was meant for, you know, three-year-old kids or four-year-old kids. Yeah, it's not going to be the best story, but you're going to be able to understand it. Just continue reading a lot of books like that, and then gradually, as your vocabulary improves and your comprehension improves, uh, just level up. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember getting a kick out of being able to read my first storybook, you know, probably made for a mother reading to their child. I, when I could read the first storybook without looking up a single word in the dictionary, I remember the thrill of that. And it seems so kind of embarrassing now. But um, now I'm watching shows that I would typically, you know, in the English world I would like, such as Uchu Kyodai. But, um, but yeah, it's been a long process. And uh, I don't think I, it would have been a smart idea back when I was a beginner to start watching Uchu Kyodai you know, in Japanese without uh, English subtitles uh, or whatever. And just, you know, it would have just been too hard. I just would have been suffering too much. Are you for or against subtitles? Uh, English subtitles? Yeah, English subtitles on Japanese content. I'm personally against them. I know that you have used them a lot in the past, but as far as I, I can see, you're the only person I know of who has been able to use 
English subtitles when watching a Japanese show and still get a lot of benefit from the constant exposure to the Japanese. I think, I think what's more common and certainly what happened to me is I would just end up reading it and the listening would sort of, over time, you could almost feel it. Like I was becoming more and more detached from the actual Japanese and all I was doing instead was um, was reading the English. And I, I still watch shows most of the time with um, Japanese subtitles. And I still rely on Japanese subtitles more than I would like. But at least I'm getting reading practice and it's I'm slowly sort of weaning my way off it. Yeah, the main way that I use subtitles was when I was listening to a long dialogue, every now and then there would be a word that I didn't understand. And the Japanese word that I didn't understand, I would usually look at the subtitles for, you know, a harder word. or And that was the main way that I used it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a that, that requires a certain kind of focus, which... I mean, I, maybe I'm just too weak to do that. I think I would just, I would just end up reading it. You know, like I wouldn't be able to train my eyes not to be constantly looking down at the subtitles. Yeah, yeah. Um, another uh, handy. Uh, what, what was it? Another. Uh, what was your terminology? Guideline. Guideline. Another guideline that I personally think is really important is just exposure. Uh, yeah, just to expose yourself, the more the better. Just keep on exposing, just really get dirty with it. I mean, just get muddy and filthy. Learning a, another language is kind of like just a big, giant mud wrestle. You know, you're just covered in mud, you're dirty, and occasionally you'll find little gems, but a lot of it is just being there in the mud, you know, uh, slipping around, tr like trying to make things work. And I think you'll just get more and more comfortable with that process and you'll get more and more used to, um, you know, that sort of experience. And, uh, and I think through that massive exposure, your brain uh, starts to figure it all out. I think, I think there is a a bit of a focus. People tend to be very focused on the idea of conscious effort, conscious effort, conscious effort all the time. But I think, I think you know, those people are maybe relying on their own conscious mind a bit too much. I think the conscious mind is only a very a small fraction of what our brain actually is. Uh, I just think that the way that you learn a language and the way that you learn almost anything just like driving a car, is the first time you do it, or the first ten times you do it, you are out on the road and you're very conscious of everything that's going on. You see there's a car over there, there's a car there, check my rear windscreen, and you can see this with new drivers, you know, they're always kind of very consciously, now I'm going to check this mirror, I'm going to check this mirror, I'm going to, you know, and whatever. And then they get worried whenever anything changes, but for more competent drivers and drive, uh, people who have been driving more, and this is the same for Japanese, you, your body adjusts to the various changes and uh, differences in the, in the flow of the experience, and it adjusts, and it essentially gets pushed more and more uh, deeper and deeper down into your unconscious mind. And so the ideal of uh, learning a language and the ideal of if you want to be a tennis player or if you want to be a great driver or whatever is to essentially get more information out of your conscious mind and into your unconscious mind, into that sort of reflex area. And so I just think that, um, yeah, this focus on really, really pushing a method on really, really, on trying to find a holy grail, as it were, or of trying to find a Rosetta Stone that will like be this amazing thing to decipher the whole language, and you'll just be able to read this thing, and the whole of the language will pop into your mind like a miracle drug, or something like that. I mean, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but um, I just really think that that sort of thing doesn't exist, and that the analogy, a better analogy, is more like just rolling around in the mud, you know, and you're just trying to figure it out as you go. Yeah, I think to get to that 
advanced stage, whether it be a driver or a tennis player or a language speaker, it's just exposure, like you say, getting that input, getting a lot of input as much as you can, and whether it be through books, listening, reading, or anything. Uh, a lot of input is really important, and I think it's important to not worry about the output at all. Just keep getting the input until you're ready for the output. Yeah, and I think uh, that that point about not worrying about output is is a uh, is a really interesting one because it's an unfortunate thing about societies in general that uh, that performance is, is really just so important that it's expected for instance in a classroom that you can speak pretty much as soon as you have heard something that you would hear it once and then you'll be able to essentially just be able to use perfectly whatever you just learnt. I mean even just when I was when I was back learning Japanese in university, the the expectation would be that when we learn how to say, may I use the bathroom or may I go to the bathroom, may I whatever that we would be able to use that grammar from then on whenever we would need it. And the um, I just don't think that's the way that it works at all. I think in the situation of a, of, a, of a child growing up in an environment, they probably hear people talking about going to the bathroom hundreds upon thousands of times before they, uh, before they are able to, you know, uh, to properly, uh, you know, use their mouth to get the words out, and also, you know, to put the words in the right order, etc., etc., etc. I mean, it's been proven by a lot of research too that little kids are, they even at extremely young ages, they're getting, even if they can't speak very well, they're very, very good at understanding the way and like the rules of the language. They've done experiments in which, for instance, a, a kid is able to put things into past tense or into um, present progressive, as in I-N-G, tense, and all that sort of thing. And they're able to, um, they're able to do that with words, uh, which aren't actually real words, even if their speaking ability in other ways aren't actually great. So there's a lot of assimilating of different things going on every time you're watching a Japanese drama, every time you're, um, you know, you're watching an anime. And I don't claim to understand what it, all of those things are, but I just think that it's it, instead of putting all of you know, your faith into a conscious process of always thinking about all the different things that are going on, I think it's much easier, it's much more freeing to just let yourself off a little bit and think, well, I'm consciously focusing on this part, but, you know, just... Just rest knowing that more is actually going in, which is, I think, a really great thing that our, our brains aren't making conscious every single little part that's going on in our bodies at all time. I mean, it would be exhausting and, uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt that this unconscious learning, as you're saying, uh, is a more effective way in terms of quality. But... How about if we compare them in terms of time? What do you think would be more efficient for an adult or just better in terms of time or more useful uh, if you're comparing methods like just getting a lot of exposure or just memorizing a sentence and then, you know, saying that sentence or repeating it over and over? What do you think would be more useful? Well, I, well, I personally think the um, the former would be more useful. the The process of of sinking it in eventually through um, through you know uh, through your conscious into your unconscious mind. I think the problem with the second, with the latter, is that it's um, it just becomes regurgitation. And the second that there is no need anymore to regurgitate the information, the information quickly flip, uh, slips out of your mind. I mean, I think there's been a lot of studies to suggest that we're, as humans, we're only able to juggle sort of two or three or four things at once. And, uh, you know, if you have a number in mind, like a girl's phone number, for example, and then, you know, something happens outside and a drunk guy falls over and, you know, spills a, a bag of oranges and it's kind of hilarious, and then, uh, and then, you, you, you will suddenly realize that you've kind of forgotten half of the numbers. 
I just don't think I don't think our conscious mind is very good at holding on to information. It's part of the problem, in my opinion, of what happens in schools, even in Japanese schools, that there's this, you know, is this sort of pummeling of new information all the time. Uh, but there isn't time to let each part sink in. There isn't enough revision going on to let each part sink in. Because, of course, you need to get on to the next grammar and turn on to the next grammar. And a little bit is going in at each time, but it's sort of, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't seem, like the, the teachers are going through so much effort, uh, it just doesn't seem as though what's actually going in really is, seems to be matching the effort that the teachers are going through. Yeah, I, I've used both methods. Uh, and with the latter, uh, just trying to memorize a few sentences and just, uh, you know, trying to use it in the right situation. It just doesn't work. Uh, I've never really done that with Japanese, but uh, I, I go to Korea about once or twice a year, and I always try to get a few sentences, uh, you know, in my memory before I go. And I'm using this method, just rote memorization, and I have very little exposure to the Korean language, like, that I should be watching. Like, I watch dramas, Korean dramas, with Japanese subtitles. Uh, I think if I were to watch Korean cartoons that little kids watch, or, you know, like toddlers watch, I think I would be able to communicate a bit better when I go to Korea. Even though I may sound like a toddler, I would actually be able to produce something. Because the way it is now, when I get there, I can't say anything other than, you know, thank you, or like, uh, yeah, that's it, just thank you, <laughs> or hello. Yeah. And it's just unfortunate, because I've invested more than 10 minutes into this language, you know, I've studied, you know, at least a couple hours, and uh, I do that every time I go, you know, I study for a couple hours, brush up on things, but when I get there, it's just gone. It just doesn't work. Yeah, it's kind of um, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because our brain doesn't really seem to care about something that we know that isn't going to be around for long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it it doesn't really care about new information unless it can determine that this new information is pertinent and interesting to it in the long run. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be kind of almost like convincing it every day or convincing it often that hey. You know, this is good information. You should be taking all this in because you're going to be using this. And I think that the constant need for, you know, everyone says, oh, like I was learning a language and then I, um, I, I was studying it for four years or something like that. And then I, uh, I stopped studying and two years later I can't remember a single word. Mm -hmm. you know? I think our brain wants to get rid of information uh, because it wants to, uh, you know, it's just adapting to whatever is actually happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, yeah, it's un it's unfortunate that you can't really learn as much as you would like to in Korean or anything else in a, such a short time. But it's just a, it's kind of a time-saving uh, thing that our brain does. Yeah, it's just, you know, managing its resources efficiently. <laughs> Yeah, I think essentially it's like a like an arrow, if you will. It's sort of like it's an arrow. Your conscious mind is like an arrow that points to information uh, for your unconscious mind to get to work on. It's like a CEO in a company, you know, kind of occasionally checks in, but otherwise it leaves most things to the um, other departments. What would you recommend as the ideal exposure? for beginners or the ideal direction that beginners should take? Well, that's a very difficult question. Uh, I'm actually, I'm a little bit uncertain myself. A little part of me thinks that studying kanji would be a great idea to really get in the thick of studying kanji. Another part of me thinks maybe not, maybe try and focus more on, on TV shows made for kids and whatnot. Maybe you have a more certain viewpoint on the issue. What do you think? I, I think, yeah. Definitely uh, get like a vocabulary book and mm. maybe you could do like some Anki reps with basic vocabulary and that should be part of your diet and the other part of your diet should be like a lot of kids shows and hopefully the words that you've learned in the vocab uh, you'll see or hear on the show.
yeah, just continue to learn vocab, study words, and uh, just watch a lot of TV shows. Yeah, ideally something close to your Japanese level. Like you shouldn't be watching like CSI in Japanese when you don't even know how to say thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I think、um, you know, just like、uh, I think the, the very early steps, you'll be、um, you just might be picking up on the exclamations that people make. You know, the on the really th- the things that they yell out just before they get attacked by a dragon or something, and then.、Um, And then you know, then you'll start to pick up on where the names are falling in the sentence, and all these other things. You'll start to pick up on more of the structure of how things are going, and、um, little things like how a joke is working in the show, and、um, how timing is being used to better carry dramatic effect, and all these sorts of things. I think you, even if you're not picking up necessarily on words, watching you know things for kids shows will really help in other. Areas which are all extremely important for language learning. You know, it's not just not just words and kanji. There's also you know all these other aspects too to sound more natural. Yeah, becoming culturally Japanese is really important too. So I think just getting used to the culture or the way people interact together, which you can only get through a show, I think, or through authentic interaction. But、uh, if you're studying Japanese from Outside of Japan, you're probably not going to have a chance for that. So, ideally, you know, TV shows you can get a lot. Not just the language, but you get the culture and the interactions. There's a lot of value in that. Yeah, yeah,、mm. yeah. Another thing too, just、uh, just briefly, is it's part of the reason too why so many websites out there, so many services out there, which are claiming to Get you speaking fluent Japanese in six months or yeah, whatever. Learn kanji in two months. Yeah, this is yeah. It's it's why they're so evil, because just by simple nature of the way that the brain works, that's impossible.、Mm-hmm. I mean, it takes a long time and a lot of exposure to get those things past your conscious mind into your unconscious mind to be able to recall at any moment、um, in a kind of instantaneous way. Um, and it's certainly, certainly longer than two months, and it's certainly more than two months worth of exposure to resources, especially if those resources, as a lot of these websites are claiming, are in mostly English anyway. I mean, yeah. So you might be able to say some basic sentences, but there's no way that if you use these resources for the two months or the six months that it's allocating, that you're going to be able to understand anything outside of those. Sentences which you've understood,、uh, which you've you know come to terms with. So it's that it's a terrible situation actually, where if you okay, you know how to say where's the library, but it doesn't get you anywhere if you can't understand the directions. Right. Yeah, and so it's a it's an awful thing that those websites are doing and those services out there are doing, trying to claim that you can do something that quickly. Uh, it's just not possible. I mean, it's like you said in a previous podcast, Derek, that kids will go through a process of learning kanji in school for years and years, and still come out with a shaky knowledge on a lot of kanji.、Mm-hmm. And so, it is absurd to think that someone can go in and learn all the kanji in six months. And don't believe anybody who tries to tell you. I mean, without exception, don't believe anybody who tries to tell you otherwise. Yeah, it's just it's it's really sad that people say things like that because、uh, you know I think a lot of people they get really hopeful when they see those posts like, oh wow, I can learn Japanese in six months for only twenty nine ninety nine a month. I should really sign up for this. You know, maybe it's going to help you improve your Japanese, but I think there are other ways that you could probably improve your Japanese for free.、Uh, I think just. If you could take any two pieces of advice from this episode, it would ju- it would be be wary of your resources unless they're Japanese, native Japanese, and two, just get a lot of exposure. Anything to add to that?、Uh, be reasonable. Yeah, yeah, that's another good one. Yeah, yeah. So there you have it, folks. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time on Guys Learning Japanese.
Okay, thanks for listening to the Guys Learning Japanese podcast. Send your questions to gljpodcast at gmail.com. We'll answer your questions on the show. Bye.